Good afternoon and welcome to The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom with Mark. This is my 28 minute slot every uh, every Friday where I talk a bit about uh, mental health issues. That's where I'm really at, that's my bag, that's my thing, that's what this show is really all about. And I talk about things from my personal experience, the things that I went through and many of my friends as we grew up um, we grew up in a rather strange sort of a society a very uh, cruel and brutal place where if you disagreed um, then you would be forced to toe the line you would be punished and the further you strayed from what was required of you the worse your punishment would be and uh, that punishment was, was physical and mental and if you were lucky you wouldn't be sent away to a boy's home or go to prison, you know, they'd try and sort you out, straighten you up, fly right and of course that did a hell of a lot of damage and the damage continues like ripples from a pond it spreads from generation to generation what I'd like you to consider is that um, monsters are not born monsters are made monsters are created by us and if we choose to live in a society then all of the people of that society are our responsibility but so often is the case, people turn their backs and say, not my problem, and they walk away, and they do nothing. And doing nothing exacerbates the situation. It can only make it worse. It's never going to solve anything. It's never going to cure anything. And when people do dreadful things, and they do do some, some pretty horrific things, terrible, terrible, cruel evil things then we punish them the whip once again we use the whip there is no carrot there is no fixing no solution we simply lock people in cages for 20 hours a day as their punishment for however long we might deem it appropriate for us to take our revenge out on them for the evil deeds that they've done and very little is ever done to fix the problem. Now if you've got a car um, and it breaks down, you don't get a sledgehammer and beat the bejazzes out of it until it goes again, because it won't. All you're going to do is break it further. And that seems to be how we decide to solve our problems, by beating them into submission, by hurting them more and more and more until they give up or walk away from this but unfortunately um, a lot of our methods the ways in which we address these problems are pretty much in their infancy infancy um, psychologists and psychiatrists are not the solvers of problems they are the watchmen who determine what kind of a danger you might be to yourself and to society and they are there to assist the authorities to minimise the damage and the impact that you might have. So they are not solvers of problems and yet the weirdest thing is the solutions are there, the way forward, the way to solve the terrible problems that we have are all there and weirdly enough um, those solutions were found in New Zealand by uh, the Dunedin study, which no one in this country has ever heard about. It's been running for decades, and it is the most comprehensive, the best study in the world, best that the world has ever known. It's, it's never really been done before. It tracked the lives of a whole bunch of people from birth right through till now, and almost all of them have stayed engaged. And some of the revelations of the study have been totally new to mental health, to science, unknown before. It tells us 
that people who are disengaged early on in life continue down that path and get worse. And without intervention, they are doomed to fail. We create failures. We make them happen. Bullying in schools has an enormous amount to do with it. Once children are disengaged and then they are subjected to cruelty and punishment, now, children are cruel, but they're not necessarily evil. They're just acting out and, and, and doing nasty things because they haven't been educated to respect things. Respect is only learned in time. Um, you need to gain an appreciation and an understanding of something before you can um, before you can truly appreciate it. And, of course, children are, are ignorant. They are empty vessels which need to be nurtured. And if we fail to nurture them and instead we abuse and punish them, then we create monsters. They become worse and worse and worse. Now, I have read many stories and heard many stories, especially when you suffer from mental health, you meet a lot of people who have a lot of problems, who are broken, and it's amazing how similar the pattern is, how, how the story gets repeated again and again of the things that went wrong and why they did what they did. And, you know, everybody is different. Everybody's experience is different. But the real monsters, the really terrible, evil people in this world had terrible evil things done to them repeatedly for years and years and years of abuse and the police didn't intervene they just punished because that's what they do they enforce the law they don't solve problems and the legal system they're not interested in solving anything either again punishment uh, the prison system everything is geared up simply to hurt people enough that they'll stop what they're doing and I would argue that that is the completely wrong tool to be using. People who, first of all, are subject to abuse need to be helped, to be saved, to be sorted, to be treated, to be turned around. They need to be able to understand how much it hurt what was done to them and how much they are hurting others and until such point as they engage and empathise they will never really understand they are simply striking out back at the world to get some kind of revenge and control back it's all they're trying to do they don't realise that and it's not always obvious the other thing is about parenting there is no training given about how to be a really good parent about tools about what to do and how to do it our parents don't teach us how to be good parents and and nor do our teachers the best you can hope for is a girl is given a doll to practice looking after babies and that's about as far as it ever goes there is nothing in society where you could take a parenting course well there's one or two around but i mean they're only token gestures that scratch at the surface they're not uh plans that you can use and you know, take videos and bring in ideas and say, this is the problem that I'm having with my child now. What do I do? I, I feel helpless and hopeless and I feel like bashing a little swine because uh, they're driving me crazy. And, and this is the way people feel, that frustration and then the anger. And, you know, sometimes they strike out and they may not necessarily mean to, but they're at the end of their tether. And they're helpless and hopeless and don't know what to do. And at that point, if we don't engage and turn things around at that point, it can only get worse. And this is where people suffer from mental health. Well, that's my little spiel today, but I just want to say 668 people committing suicide a year is far too many, and it keeps going up. It is not going down. This is a real crisis. This is a national crisis that needs to be addressed. I'm doing my little bit, but I need you to get in behind me and try and help in any way that you can, in any way that you feel comfortable with. Don't turn your back. Don't walk away and say it's not my problem, because it is. This is your society, your world, and the future for the Mokapuna is what you lay on today, what you create and make happen. You can make this a better place, or you can turn your back and make it worse. So 
I appeal to anyone who can help people with mental health in any way whatsoever, just get engaged, try and help and do what you can. Support people like me, that'd be a good idea if you don't feel like you want to go out and do it yourself. Help others who do want to do it, who feel the need. Right, well I'm going to bring you a slightly lighter note and a good little story today. This is uh, one of the stories from Africa. That's my thing. I uh, I don't just talk about mental health issues. I read my stories. And the reason for that is not only are they entertaining, but they also remind me of a time when I was in a much better state. And I spent many years overseas. Uh, I spent a couple of years in Africa. And, you know, all those travels certainly broadened my mind and lightened me. And I got to see so many people all over the world. And I had all kinds of ignorant preconceptions before I met these people. And the way I was treated, with kindness, with love, with the, just that genuine, you know, Aroha is not, is not unique to Māori. It, it exists everywhere in the world. And I met so many good people, different colours, different races, different religions, all of them good people. And I was just amazed, humbled and, and honoured to be treated so well by so many. And, you know, I will never forget that. Right, time's ticking, so we've got to kick on with today's story. Let's do this thing. This is called the Kalahari and the Chobe River. Four of us struck out north from Pretoria, South Africa. We headed for the thirsty land of the Kalahari. Seedy, Wayne, Dave and myself had bought a car in Johannesburg and were driving up to the Chobe River on the far side of the Kalahari Desert. We planned to drive the length of the Kalahari to one of the three great river systems to the north. Our aim was the Chobe National Game Park in Botswana. Our first day's drive from Pretoria was a mix of acceleration and trepidation. At first there was the reassurance of farms and horticulture made possible with irrigation. South Africa, for all of its shortcomings, still had well-organised systems in place, which made life possible in tremendous heat. When the Dutch first crossed this place, they named them the Thirsty Lands. Driving over the border from South Africa to southern Botswana was like day to night. Suddenly the desert proper began looking reminiscent of the Australian outback. A large straight motorway led us into sandy, rather barren land that had not seen rain or any water in a long time. Occasionally the motorway opened out and doubled as a landing strip for planes. There was very little game around as a result of little foliage. The little we saw in our travels looked half starved. We planned to spend as little time as possible in the southern parched lands and head for the promise the northern rivers provided. There are three great river systems in the north. The Okavango, which starts life in the Angolan Heights and floods erratically through northern Botswana. Secondly, the Kuando River starts in Namibia and again erratically floods marshlands until it becomes the Chobe River system in Botswana. The Chobe then meets the mighty Zambezi, which flows down from Zambia, and they become the amazing Victoria Falls on the Zambia-Zimbabwe border. We were heading to the middle river system, where it turns into the Chobe River in a well-established national park. It boasts some of the greatest concentrations of game anywhere in Africa. The water and grasslands attract hundreds of thousands of wildebeest and zebra along with gazelles, kudu and impala and giraffes and so on. They in turn attract lions, leopards, cheetahs and hyena. The most impressive of all, however, are the tens of thousands of elephants this good grazing attracts. But before we reached the grassy north, we had to battle through the parched south. We pulled into a small town in the middle of nowhere after trying a shortcut which resulted in some damage to the car. While refuelling and getting repairs done, we stopped for a coke and were mobbed by about a hundred local kids. 
We were told most of them had never even seen a white man, and they delighted in pinching the hair on our arms to make sure that we were real. The children were full of life and very clean considering the lack of water. But we pushed on hard north, driving from dawn till after dark, and managed to spend only a few nights in the desert, camping where and when we had to. After stopping in another nowhere town, Seedy decided to rattle off a few photographs. Unfortunately, he accidentally photographed mud huts surrounded by razor wire with a sign saying military installation on it. Before long, a jeep turned up on the scene, and at first the boys in the back holding AK-47s were all smiles for the camera. Suddenly, however, the sergeant took exception to what we were doing and angrily demanded to see our film. Smiles suddenly turned to frowns, and suddenly we were facing four loaded AK-47s. At first, Seedy tried to argue with the sergeant, but as things escalated, changed his mind and handed over the camera. The ignorant sergeant then exposed the film to sunlight, then rolled it up and took our details, promising to return it once checked. This at least diffused the scary situation, and the privates shouldered their weapons. Life is cheap in Africa, and I truly feared for our lives for a few minutes. We couldn't get out of that town fast enough, and it was good to get back on the road north. After a few more days of motoring through the desert, we finally started to see some green trees and increased amount of scrub and life. Then one day, I came round the corner and all of a sudden three elephants were wandering across the motorway, blocking our way. For a few seconds, I was too stunned to do anything as these massive animals ambled along. This was our first introduction to the Chobe area and stunned us all to see these great creatures wandering free in the open. Before long we reached the game park proper and were surprised to see how little infrastructure there was to the place. There were a few safari styled places set up but other than that no real camps as such. We simply paid to enter and were free to set up camp anywhere we could. Upon entering the game park, we were blown away by the incredible amounts of life everywhere. Hundreds of species of birds, zebra and wildebeest in their countless thousands, antelope-like gazelles, the huge impala and the impressive kudu with its corkscrew horns, all of them in massive numbers. Many other game, like giraffes and hippos, were also common along the river. But the most impressive of all was a vast number of elephants wandering freely. All of these animals in turn attracted huge numbers of predators like lions, cheetahs and leopards. On our first day in the Chobe National Game Park, we met up with some hunters who told us they were culling elephants. The numbers were too great to sustain and they were devastating the bush habitat. They were culling whole family units at a time, so as to cause as little disruption as possible. We found it hard to believe that such wholesale slaughter was necessary, though their explanation was compelling. On the river itself we saw elephants to the red horizon. Nothing could have prepared us for that magnificent sight. As the sun slowly lowered red to the horizon, the elephants came down to bathe. Even the grumpy hippo were forced to give up the best parts of the river. The elephants truly revel joyously in this time. They play with their young free in their great numbers from any predator. Instead the lions lie hidden in the long grasses, watching patiently for an opportunity of easier prey. Life on the river runs like clockwork, and each animal that needs water has its turn. On our first day on the Chobe River, we caught the last half of the day. We found a flat patch of grass at around lunchtime. We were immediately robbed of biscuits by monkeys when we stopped for a feed. 
Dozens of baboons descended upon the scene after the monkeys, and we quickly learned to leave nothing out for the robbers to have. The male baboons were particularly large and intimidating with their huge fangs and showing little fear of man. The best way to spot game was from the relative safety of the car. So after setting up our tents, we set off on the unsealed, sandy, bumpy roads. I was the designated driver by now, and the roads were sorely testing. I quickly learned the most dangerous time was driving through a family group of elephants. The young ones, ranging from one to two tons, would suddenly charge head first towards us. These mock charges were truly frightening and the only way to stop them is to plant boot and charge at them. The dust and the roar of the engine puts them off, but I had to be careful not to hit them as four-ton mum was always looking on. The large bull elephants, however, must be avoided at all costs. They are short-tempered, huge and run surprisingly quickly. We watched them bulldoze whole trees down and strip them of all leaves. The amount of devastation caused was unbelievable. After spending the afternoon game spotting, we returned back to cook tea. As we cooked up what we had on the riverside camp, a family of warthogs came trotting past us and into their burrows in the riverbed. The water flowed quickly at this point, so there were no crocodiles about. All the same, I felt very vulnerable in our makeshift camp. I didn't sleep at all well, and at about 2am something came sniffing at my head. With only a millimetre of plastic between us, I was frozen with fear. The creature then moved off, and I fell into a whiskey-induced sleep. I woke at the dawn chorus of birds and general wildlife. I poked my head out of the tent to watch our warthog neighbours trot past on their way out. The four of us headed out after breakfast. We spent all day driving around game spotting and before long Dave spotted a lioness in the long grass. I stopped and hopped out for a better look but could not see her. I walked forward but still I couldn't see her, not until she blinked. By then it became suddenly obvious that she could run me down, so I slowly backed up without unlocking eye contact. It was the first and last time I made that mistake in Africa. We had a great day game spotting with loads of beautiful antelope to watch along with any big cats that might be following. The middle of the day was too hot however for the cats and the game was left to graze in freedom. Generally speaking, only the young and very old are really vulnerable, and they are culled from the herd most often. We then headed back to camp for tea and sunset. A huge number of elephants came down to the river each sunset to bathe and turned on a hell of a show. Our campsite was perfectly elevated for viewing up the river with binoculars. The sight of at least 120 animals in the lenses was something no zoo or wildlife centre could ever have prepared me for. Slowly, as I got more used to being surrounded by wildlife, the adventure became more enjoyable. We clicked into a routine of getting up at dawn and driving around game spotting each day. We soon learned the best spots near our camp and no two days were ever quite the same. On one hot afternoon we were watching a huge bull elephant bulldoze down trees. He had a particularly huge set of tusks and made for some great photographs. Suddenly Wayne decided he needed a good close-up and jumped out of the car and approached the huge beast. The elephant suddenly turned his attentions from the tree he was eating to Wayne. The bull stomped his foot and flared his great ears in warning, but Wayne remained oblivious, happily snapping off some great shots. The bull then trumpeted, stamped his huge foot, and it was all too late for Wayne as he began to charge. I'm out of here, I shouted to Wayne, and turned away, planting boot as I went. Wayne made a sudden sprint for the car and managed to dive head first through the passenger side of the window as I spun the wheel. As I roared off, my foot flat to the floor, 
All I could see was the huge elephant's head in the rear vision mirror. I could feel the ground shaking as he charged after us. Luckily I had just enough power to out-sprint the bull and slowly pull away from him with Wayne hanging halfway out the open window. Far too close for comfort. After that incident we made sure not to push our luck too much as these animals were truly wild and had little fear of man. At one point the road was blocked by a troop of baboons with one particularly belligerent male that parked himself in the middle. I got out to shoo him away only to come darting back in as he screamed and charged at me. We soon learned not to underestimate any of the wildlife about. Living conditions were the most basic at our makeshift camps. The river water was unusual, unusable because of bilharzia, a nasty waterborne parasite that attacks the liver and has no cure. We were also limited by our food stores which we rationed carefully. Luckily enough there were no more incidents at camp so we were able to adapt to the routine of the river. Each morning our warthog neighbours would parade past at dawn as we made breakfast. We spent each day trying to spot new species as well as our favourites. The giraffes were always fun to watch as they looked so awkward as they stooped not need to drink. Although ungainly to look at, they made for great watching as they graze high up in the trees. Pretty much every species had some impressive attribute, from the grace of the antelope to the stealth of their predators, to the massive horned water buffalo, the ugly looking wildebeest, the beautiful zebra and all the other grazers. The most impressive of all, however, were the massive elephants with their huge tusks and trunks. To my mind at least, they were the kings of the jungle. Despite the hardships we had to endure, our time at Chobe was over all too soon. But I feel we left a little piece of ourselves there, and took a little bit of that place with us. I look back on those days wistfully now, and I am sure the three guys I travelled with feel the same. The end. Well there we go, a minute to spare. I just want to finish by saying... Um, welcome to my friends in the beautiful Hawke's Bay. Nice to have you aboard. I hope you enjoy my show. I want to say a big thanks to all the sponsors of the show. It's imperative they give us that assistance as this is a not-for-profit organisation. And most of all to Veronica and to Michael and to Wairapa TV for making all this happen and allowing me to do this show. I am very appreciative of it. I hope you enjoy it and I hope you spread the good word and support it. Thank you very much and... Uh, We'll see you next week. Bye for now.